building for enterprise by testing OSS or open source, one code base to rule them all. So this is an experience report. I'm going to tell you an amazing story. All of it is true. I'm going to provide sarcasm. I think I'm funny. Please just laugh so that I can still think I'm funny. You cannot. It's all good. I'm Chaim. I work for Redis uh, based in Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, I can't pretend to have worked for Redis elsewhere, but I'm told the other offices are actually better. Um, I've done a ton of open source historically, worked on some operating systems, some Linux kernels. I've been using Linux since 93, um, which for me means I was 14 years old. For some of you, hopefully you were all born because someone made fun of me earlier today. And that's my jam. So how many of you have heard this? You were building software, you were building a product. I want it amazing. I want it with all of the features I don't even know about, and I want it on time. Yeah, happens a lot. Probably happened on Tuesday because you had that sad, sad frown. I'm going to tell you the story. Depending on your point of view, it's a dumpster fire or it's all good. So how many of you have used Redis? OK, thank you. I always need a plant. So if you know Redis, it is thought of mostly as a really high-speed cache. It is on everything under the sun. I have a bunch of smart switches in my house, like for power. Turns out they all have Redis on them, which is great. It's open source, but most people think about Redis as like you set something, you get something, it expires from the cache. Amazing. Dumpster fire. That's a good thing. We actually have a whole bunch of other stuff that people don't know about as much. And honestly, me too, when I joined Redis. We have capabilities that allow you to store JSON and do searching and use it for bloom filters. And there's a graph database in there. Um, there's just a ton of things you can do with Redis. So our story is about trying to build some sort of a product that people will say, hold on a second, you can use all of this with Redis. Like I can get one Redis that has the JSON module and the search module and all of these things. And that product is called Redis Stack. This talk is not about Redis Stack. It's about the engineering that goes into building that sort of thing. So if you need to package something for multiple operating systems and you live this weird world, this is great. And if you don't, I am so sorry you're suffering for the rest of this talk. So we had a ton of challenges, right? The ask was, OK, you guys build Redis. It's open source. We have this cache. Great. We compile it. Amazing. Um, I need to build that. And I need to build that for stuff I don't know about. I don't know what my target operating systems are going to be. I don't know what my target package types are going to be, right? If you're a Mac user and you're a developer, you're probably using Homebrew to go install whatever it is you need. Brew install foo. You're a Linux user and you're running Ubuntu, you're going to need a deb. If you're a Linux user and you're running on Red Hat, you're going to want an RPM. If you're a Linux user and you're me, you can't do any of that, but that's OK. My life is self-inflicted. So we have these loosely defined asks. I'm going to build some Redises, and they're going to have capabilities, which is our Redis stack, and that's great. But there's multiple downstream operating systems. That means I'm going to build it for Ubuntu Xenial 16.04 when we started the project. I'm going to build it for Red Hat 7. I'm going to build it for I don't know, because again, they're loosely defined asks. That's OK. So we don't know what those package types are. I don't know what you're running. I don't know what you want to run. I don't even know what we're planning on supporting. So for me, the ask is, remember, go back to that quote. I need all of it. I need it flexible. I need the ability to do all of the things. And we're basically talking about packages, right? Like zip files and tarballs and things like that that just have metadata. Um, also, for the record, we do this for our enterprise product, which is it's just different. So this is actually really fun. Like To me, this is amazing. Don't know what I'm going to do. We're going to do stuff. It's great. It will be reproducible, because that's what we do. And if you're into software testing, which I also care about, there's like, how do I test across multiple operating systems? And what about architectures, right? Like Most people, we think about x86. Unless you're a Mac M1 user, you might think about the M1 a little bit. But honestly, I run Linux. I've been running Linux since 93. I can't tell you the last time I cared about Linux on anything that wasn't x86, except for some ARM work, right, basically. And then what about the installation context, right? That person uses Homebrew. That guy runs Ubuntu. That guy cares about Docker. You're running things in Kubernetes, which is still Docker. But this is a lot to test. Like, the matrix alone is bigger than the ask. And once you get to installing software, if you're installing, say, in a Docker, amazing. I don't care about services. If you're installing in the operating system, don't I need some way to start and stop services? And it gets ugly once you get into what has changed recently. So I want you to kind of feel the matrix. I have a good title for this, and I suck at drawing. So operating systems have packages. OK, 
Sometimes they have secondary packages. What does that mean? I have an Ubuntu, I need a deb, like a Debian archive, and because I'm gonna build a Docker and that Docker is also going to be based on the same operating system, awesome, that's my secondary package. I go, Ubuntu, build me a Debian, cool, also build me a Docker. Pretty easy, pretty painless. This is how that matrix changes just a little bit. We haven't left the first operating system. I've got Ubuntu, great, a specific version, Okay, I build a deb. I also build a tarball because some people just want to download things and not use package feeds. Let's let people work the way they best want to work. We talked about Dockers, but some people use snaps and some people use app images, which are just different packaging formats, ideally. And this becomes more painful. We haven't left Ubuntu yet. I have, we talked about x86. We talked about some people having ARM, right? So you take this and you multiply it by two because if I want to build a Docker, and have it be available on multiple platforms, the easiest thing to do is honestly build that Docker twice on multiple platforms. But for the user, I need to build it once. When I go Docker pull, and great, I got the x86 Docker or I got an ARM Docker, that's actually a manifest containing a couple of Dockers and I learned things I wish I never knew, which I kind of like. This is what we're gonna do. This is how this happens. We write some software, we build some software, we package some software. We're gonna talk lightly about security, so like how do you sign code? Because to be honest, that was a big roadblock for me. How we even try to test this, and the part everyone cares about is where did you screw up along the way and what can I take with me, and oh my lord, did I screw up along the way. It's great. So code. The thing that I cared about, honestly, and the thing you always have to look at when you do these weird things, is I don't want to do them twice, right? Like we think about CI and we throw things into GitHub Actions, but at the end of the day, I want my code in one place. I don't care what the platforms is, are, pardon me. It's not like I'm compiling something. We're talking about configuration files because they're packages. We're talking about services and service definitions. Um, in my case, I said we're going to download known pre-built binaries. I'm not going to go compile Redis every time on every platform for every push that we make or every time we change something. So we're going to do it once. We're going to push it somewhere so that we have it because that's our philosophy anyways. And all of these capabilities, because there's different teams that build different things, we're just going to go take their binaries and package it. Um, if you were around in 2004 and remember disting, which was like this process of publishing things in various steps, I don't do new things. I just bring old things with new software. We're going to generate configs. We're going to package artifacts like we talked about, build those debs, build those snaps, whatever. And we're going to make it very, very easy and lazy. I don't know about you. Personally, I am incapable of remembering all of the command switches for everything I want. I mean, I'd like to. There's just too much. Um, we're going to write Python. So I use the invoke library just so that you get a reasonable command line tool with almost nothing to do. So we have one interface to rule them all. This entire set of problems is available in an open source repository. If you remember nothing, it's GitHub, Redis, Stack, Redis, Stack. But each slide will have where you can find the pieces we're talking about. So tools, OK. What we ended up using, what you have to do to make this happen is obviously GitHub Actions, like I want stuff to run when I type push. Okay, that's a gimme, great. Um, it needs to be scriptable, so pyinvoke so that I have a single set of nice command line tools as an entry points. Pytest because I wanted to test it, so I needed a very flexible testing framework. And Jinja, which is a templating library for Python, pardon me, because Again, I want to generate those configuration files in each place. I want to generate the service definition. I, originally, I had to, in order to change how a service started, edit four, five, eight files I don't even remember anymore, to be honest. And that was a big mistake. Um, in order to test things, if you have a Mac, you're used to the emulation layer that Apple provides you called Rosetta. So you're running an M1. It happens to be an ARM. Turns out you can run x86 software. A lot of people do under the covers and don't know. That's great. On the Linux side, we used QMU to do the reverse. I've got a Linux, and I want to test the ARM code on my x86 Linux. So QMU just does that for us, gives us the virtual machines we care about without noticing. Dockers are Dockers. Um, ACT, if there's one thing that you take from this and you have to maintain GitHub pipelines in any way, you can use ACT to run your configs before you check them in. I honestly wish I was more diligent about that and didn't rely on my CI system, but I'm a realist. 
And the big, the heavy worker in all this is FPM. It is an old project that some people associate with PHP. Um, PHP FPM is a web server accelerator. But FPM is Jordan Zissel's project from 2006, maybe, to enable building multiple package types from a single code base. At the end of the day, I run FPM with a whole bunch of different options each time. And that's what the magic is. FPM makes it super simple to spit out snaps, debs, RPMs. If you have package to app image, you get app images too. So the magic is like the tool making it work and the scripting around it to make it lazy and figuring out how you can do that. Also, stop me whenever you want, by the way. So building it, well, I need a lightweight CI. Um, I need it to be very, very, very easy to maintain because, to be honest, I don't want to be doing this forever. I really want someone else to take this off my plate as quickly as possible. I want it to call the invoke that we write, that collection of Python scripts. Why? Because a lot of us have a tendency to do things within CI and they live in CI. It's problematic. Honestly, some of the Redis stack code today still, still shows that. Um, but the idea of being able to easily test anything locally, that's very big. And if CI can only call your scripts under the covers, that means you can test everything everywhere. More importantly, we have a build chain. So this is a smaller screenshot of what that means. I'm going to build something for Red Hat. Cool, I'm then going to go package it for Red Hat. I'm going to build something for Bionic and Ubuntu 18.04, pardon me. I'm going to package it there. That makes sense. I'm building, do whatever, packaging, do whatever. This set of chains becomes a, frankly, I can't fit it on a screen on my actual computer loop, which is a series of operating systems, sometimes multiple architectures, sometimes they package, packaging leads. But the idea is that CI is that train. It helps you get through it all. Mm, I'm curious what I'm going to get. Cool. So this is how that happens in GitHub. I just want to give you a snippet. All of these do the same thing. What you'll notice is this is a Red Hat. This is an Ubuntu. And at the end of the day, we're going to reuse a workflow file that's highlighted in that repo. So there's a single workflow in the repository. We reuse it with that uses statement. Then we can pass in all the variables we want. I can start the jammy docker. I can use Oracle Linux 8 to represent a Red Hat. I could use different versions of Python if I need to. I hope I don't need to again. I did at one point in time. And I can have different build dependencies because in Ubuntu, I install things with apt. In this version of Red Hat, I use DNF. Um, frankly, that allows me the flexibility to have one job that just requires inputs so that when we added a new operating system, it was as simple as like, just take that snippet at the top, copy it, give it a couple names, move along. Then we get to packaging. Packaging is that piece that it's all of this. Um, and it's painful, and it's awesome. So the thing you're doing when you're creating packages, I don't know if anyone here built a deb or an RPM or any of these painful things. Thank you. <laughs> Once upon a time, we all maintained this by hand, and it was, I'll say, painful. Um, I mean, once upon a time. You don't have to anymore, thankfully. But the biggest problem that we had is we didn't know what the pieces were going to be. We don't necessarily know what the different versions or branches of the same thing at the same time we want to support. Um, and in the case of part of this, we embed Redis Insight, which is a visualization tool. And that comes with a version of Node.js. So I, just, I need a lot of flexibility to just download the right things, quite frankly. That's where the Python comes in. There's a single Python file. Again, it's all in that repo. That single Python file has a list of versions. And in each branch, let the versions be as different as they possibly can be. I don't think I want to care. I don't think, as a user, we care. But I very much care that it is lazy, and you can send a pull request. And frankly, we also need this to be testable in enterprise. In enterprise, that became easier, because enterprise doesn't have to build all of these packages for all of these operating systems. It does that and other things. So since Enterprise, the Redis Enterprise product, has its own build system and parts I don't touch, frankly, there, they, just, they have a JSON file. They go fetch whatever it is they need to do, like us, just a different testing matrix. The big piece for me is ongoing generation, right? We talked about using FPM to build packages. That same interface, that same product, huge, or product, pardon me, project is huge for me. I get RPMs. Honestly, I'm never, I'm just not going to remember 
how to use RPM build anymore. I don't know how to write spec files. Nothing against, I think that's a great thing. Also on the Debian side, back in the day, I had to handcraft pieces like control files. I don't anymore, but my brain can't keep any of that in place. Hence, anything I can use tools for. Ginge is the part I care about the most. Um, a bunch of you have probably built Dockers before, and you either go down this path where you have multiple Docker files, or you go down this path where you embed some bash in your Docker file and then inject variables at build time, probably via the args, and then back into env and make it work. Um, I saw you nod. I like that. So this is a big thing for us. We'll talk about where we used it everywhere at the end of the day. For me, and the only way I'm willing to build a Docker file now, only because I haven't used Podman, is write a Docker file. It's going to contain Jinja, which is very, very, very light templating, like effectively no templating, and then use Jinja to generate the actual Docker files, which is great because you can have snippets that you include in places. You can have actual if-else for loops, like you've got code because you have a templating language, and you have Python, so you could extend your templating language with your own tags. Um, that becomes really, really powerful depending on what you need to do. And also, we're going to call native tools. So FPM, it's great that it's a packaging tool, but it calls RPM under the covers. It calls deb under the covers. It, you know, when I build a Docker, I call Docker under the covers, and that's important. And again, it all has to be reusable with invoke. I want to type like invoke, package, blah. Invoke, build, blah. Because then my CI is in a better place, and frankly, I sleep. This is that Jinja sample, just so that you see how absolutely painless this is. I have something that looks like an if statement in every language under the sun. I have whatever the code was for my Docker, because nothing has changed. I have an elf that looks like, uh, elf, pardon me, else, that looks like many of the languages we have, and I have an end. If you are used to templating in Django, if you are used to templating in Beehive, this will just feel very natural. It's also, thankfully, battle-tested and not new, which means at least every time you find a bug, you feel great about yourself, you go check it out and say, man, that bug's been around for 13 years and it's just not getting fixed. But that's okay. And then you end up extending your matrix, right? We talked originally about how, well, we build for an OS and. But now, and this is how our Dockers get built, we build for those operating systems, ARM, and x86. We build the packages and test the packages for those operating systems. We build the dockers that target those operating systems, so separate dockers. Then we create the manifest itself and pump it upstream. Um, the important part is that because all of these are separate steps, they're all independently testable. And the majority of the testing isn't how do I make GitHub do this. To be honest, I have a lot of that because there's, there's always going to be cleanup to do. But the majority of the testing is the changes that I wanted to make. This, config fi this configuration file change right here to change how the service starts. I'm not going to go test that 26 times, right? I'm going to put it in. I'm going to let CI let me know if I really broke that or not. Like, I'll test it once and let it multiply. And that's very, very valuable because that lets me multiply developers. All right, so I promised you lightweight security, which is code signing. The beauty of working on Linux, I have to say, and I'm so biased because I've done it forever, is like you can take a GPG key and you can sign an RPM, you can take a GPG key, you can stamp a deb. I haven't actually made a Docker trust. I think that should be easy. I just haven't done it. So if anyone has, I would love to see that because I need to do it. Also, it's open source. Um, and what you see here, again, remember, you can go to that repository, read all of the code. I purely want to highlight on any slide where and the piece that matters. So in my reusable step where I know what I'm building, so cool, I'm building that RPM. For an RPM, I need to import the key. I need to send the passphrase. I need to call RPM sign in a specific way. Awesome. I also don't ever have to remember that. The first thing you'll notice is that this is bad on me, right? That's code that lives inside of GitHub Actions. I need that in a shell script, and that's, as I mentioned, there's cruft I got to clean up. For a tarball, you can make those detached armor files. Again, the same code, the same technology, the same under the covers standard Unix tools. This is harder to see, I apologize. Um, on OS 10, I don't know if anyone's had to build something for the App Store 
by hand. Um, because what we were doing under the covers is the GCC and not stock Apple tools, to be honest, I need a way where I can sign the Apple binaries. Because if you brew install Redis stack, or you brew install Redis stack, and you go, okay, Redis stack, first thing you get is that pop-up that says like, are you sure? And there was a lot of trial and error um, because frankly, the documentation probably needs better reading and I need better comprehending. Um, so I'm the problem, right? Um, the piece that matters, again, same code, where specifically to find it if this is your series of problems. With Apple, the learning piece for me is you actually have to sign every part of the binary chain. If I'm building a package, like an OS X package or a zip file, even though I'm signing it and notarizing it because they have a two-step phase, I have to do that for every single file that's in that package. That includes a shell script that's in that package. Then I have to stamp the package in a particular way with, I believe it's code sign, and tell it this file in the repo, these entitlements that to be honest, I kind of broke my head trying to find out what they all were because at the time the documentation was poor, it was about a year ago. So these things, they can run in this way. It's okay for you to be a service. It's okay for you to be dynamically loaded even though you're a shared object. These are things that are just fine to do. The part that's the hardest, and I recognize this is difficult to see, is Apple's code sign wasn't built for doing this in continuous integration. Um, if you've built a mobile app, right, you've clicked, Xcode does its thing, that's great. But if you're doing this in GitHub Actions, the, or any action tool, use Circle CI, go nuts, the problem that I end up having is I need to submit a request, which is fine, and I need to get back an answer and that answer is probably going to be no for a long time, and then all of a sudden the answer is yes. Um, so the reality is there's nothing special there, hence having a sleep for a minute, because what do I care? But it's discovering that this is the process by which you can actually ship this software is the bigger problem. Um, I will say that what happens here is something I really dislike. CI all of a sudden sometimes becomes non-deterministic because it's reasonable for your signing request to be signed in two minutes. It frequently is. It's reasonable for your, C your signing request to fail after 10 minutes. But if you think about CI, I don't want something purely sitting there and spinning forever. I will usually get a failed or successful eventually, and I will say about 90% of the time, this text is what comes back from when you W, or what I use, W get something or curl it or whatever I did at the end of the day. But the reality is you just you have to be fine with like relative failure in CI when it comes to Apple's code sign. Um, and I think given what they've done, it, I, I totally get it. So all right, where are we? We're going to pause. We talked about some of the code for this. We talked about how it was built from chaining these pieces together. We talked about the packaging. I'm using the word secure to mean code signed, to be fair. So we've talked about that. We absolutely haven't talked about test. And there's a layered-based approach to testing. So I've got Redis. I know that thing is battle-tested, right? I've got a repo. Well, the Redis open source team, they have a repo. I can just rely that when I check out Redis, I'm getting a tested Redis, right? Except that I'm compiling Redis. And I might be compiling Redis on platforms that just haven't been tested in CI. So I will absolutely rely on Redis's testing for the reasons I should. But, and I'll rely on the capabilities tests equally. But I'm going to sit up a level. I'm going to have tests for my package. Could I install it and remove it? Awesome. If I installed it and removed it, can I start? Can I use a hello world amongst all of the features that we have? I mean, generally, if your capability works and you can call the code that's in some shared object and it doesn't barf and they're pre-built for you, it's reasonable to assume that that worked. And the fact that I can do it through Redis, that becomes a reasonable assumption. And eventually, we want to test this in our ecosystem. We eat our own dog food. Um, these same set of packages that are going to be released for people, we also publish the nightly build to Docker Hub. Great. And the folks who work on Redis clients use the nightly build of that thing. So that, you know, I'm not going to say there aren't bugs, because obviously there are bugs. But there's a lot of dog food being eaten before that ever gets out the door. And for me, that's really important because it's one thing to say I accept tests. It's another to say I'm going to test the thing I have, but that extra piece of like there are people who rely on the tip of the tip of the tip means that when it's broken, it's really broken and that's great. Not for people other than me, but I'm happy. 
So we're PyTest powered. There was going to be a whole cat thing, but then Reddit has their issues, so I didn't want to go there. Um, PyTest is a testing framework in Python. It is unbelievably flexible. Um, if you're a Python user, it's flexible for flexible. Everyone has a framework they like. You might be exploring robot framework if you're a Python person. I will only have good things to say about PyTest. I'll have more good things to say about PyTest. It's my like standard for every time I go write some Go and I use Testify or I use something else, I go, man, I wish you were PyTest. Like, you're so close. Um, it has full lifecycle complexities. What does that mean? You're used to set up and tear down for a test. Of course. You're used to set up and tear down for a suite. That also makes sense. Um, but the combinations thereof of set up and tear down for a test or for a suite or a collection, which is a thing we take for granted in many languages, just doesn't exist in other languages. So if I'm building something to test things, and I'm already using Python as my scripting framework, it's a very natural choice. Um, also, it's got markers, which I like, and aren't available everywhere. So if I have a series of tests, and I want to tag some of these, you run only on Zinial, you run only on this OS, you're only for an ARM, all of a sudden I can say, cool, PyTest, uh, dash M, like IE, go run my marker, ARM, fantastic, ARM and this, ARM and that, these and not those things, because it accepts Boolean logic on the command lines within the marker statement, which is great, because again, if you want to test only one thing, and maybe you want to test only one thing across all of your platforms, that becomes really, really useful. Um, also, because I'm really, really lazy. So what about enterprise? You got that, nice. I said bad jokes, I promised them. So in enterprise, I have, there's this enterprise testing team who I'm responsible for, and we have a very similar approach. We use the exact same tooling. We use the exact same approach to testing software. The difference is what goes in, and that's why open source helps enterprise, right? We have this open source product, we have this enterprise product, and the reality is these two play together really well because we learn from each other, even though it's not always one team, but it, it very much feels like it's one team. For enterprise, there are environments. Um, just like in open source, I need to, I, it's more I need to validate the package, like did you install and remove, that's great. From an enterprise perspective, I'm part of something, right? Redis stack is inside of Redis Enterprise. So the change happened to PyTest itself. Because it's a testing framework, because it's Python, because you can manipulate it, it becomes really interesting because you can change things purely on the command line, right? I want to take this and I want to test it with that thing over there, that Redis that should have everything that I need. I want to take this and I want to test it over there. There's small changes. Like everyone else, I want a pre-built environment for this, right? Uh, we use env0, it spins up a bunch of stuff with Terraform, it shows up in AWS, amazing. And then PyTest can just go run its tests. Um, and I would like to pretend it is that simple, and most of the time it is, but we screw up, or I do. And then the part I care about are configuration overrides. I need to have sensible defaults. I need the ability to override them, because sometimes someone might want to test just one thing that they're building, get your binary from over there. So we have this descending concept of override configs. If you set it in the environment, obviously, that's just going to take precedence because that solves the Kubernetes problem. If you happen to set it in a YAML file, fantastic. I get it. You're generating something with GitHub Actions. Um, and since everything, the PyTest code itself, reads the config parser that loads the same YAML file and the environment variables, every single variable that could possibly be there might as well just become a PyTest option. That way no one has to think, um, myself included. And that lets us test smarter, which is really about doing less work. I'm going to mark my tests. I run very specific things on very specific operating systems in one code base. The same tests may be run as on ARM, may not be run as ARM. It depends. Maybe I want to skip things for version, right? I need this to run only on version X of the enterprise product, not on version Y. And I'm relying on PyTest to do all of that. I have a function, I decorate it with an at sign, and I move along. And to be honest, we use this philosophy today. The tests for uh, Redis Py, the Python Redis library, the exact same tests, are tested against Redis Enterprise by passing in a PyTest argument, like dash dash, use this Redis instead of that Redis. Uh, so this is very much about eating our own dog food, or in my case, me eating our own dog food, because unfortunately the test folks and the client folks, I work with them. 
I manage those teams. Open source, it's different. Open source Redis stack, we're top of the stack, right? We've built all of this stuff. We've built the whole funnel. Um, and again, I'm relying on Redis. I'm relying on the tests. I'm relying on the capabilities tests. So this JSON thing, I don't need to test that in depth. I need to validate it. In enterprise, I need to test it more heavily because the product's a little bit different. In open source, I need to validate it. And that becomes a philosophical difference. The services and configurations are what matter to me. In a Docker, the way I'm starting my application is the entry point. I hope that entry point works out right. Like I start the Docker and just throw things at it. Fantastic. But if I'm caring about an Ubuntu or a homebrew-based install for a Mac, I need to run the inst like brew install that thing. I need to brew uninstall that thing. I need to check that it uninstalled cleanly. And these are small things that we all take for granted. But at the same time, that context doesn't apply in Docker. If I'm running my same test from my same code base in Python, I want to know, I'll be honest with you, OK, cool. I'm running these tests here. So since I'm running them in a Docker, I'm running them over the Docker bridge. So instead of using uh, Python's subprocess.run to run things locally, I'm going to find my container and then use container run. And I have to parse the outputs. And sometimes I get a good return code. Sometimes I don't over the container bridge. So it's string processing as opposed to run something locally. And because I'm connecting to a Redis locally, I can like, directly issue my Redis commands and friends. And frankly, because you're building this thing at the top of the stack, all of this is hello world, right? I just want to test that all of my components validate, and it's mostly about the packaging and their integration. Um, that means in OSS, I have complete control. So I mentioned on the enterprise side, I accept I receive environments, but in open source, my philosophy is I'm going to create them. So that same repo, which I keep pointing to because it's open source, has the code that starts a Docker and starts a Docker and runs all of our tests. All of our Debian tests, or sorry, pardon me, all of our Ubuntu tests as an example. Well, Ubuntu 16.04, 18.04, 20.04, 22.04, all inherit from the same base class. That way, the tests for Debian have a single installer, right? Run install this way, go do a deb, dpackage dash i, whatever, move along. Um, and again, it's all of that reuse that cares about. Those markers now become interesting for cases, because the case in open source is an operating system, or it's the combination of an operating system and a platform, right? Did this work on ARM with an Ubuntu? Fantastic. Dash m this, dash m that, none of us should care. Um, does this work in ARM? and a platform and on a physical machine. So there's code in here to manipulate Vagrant, um, which is a technology that allows you to easily set up VMs from the command line with VirtualBox or with QMU. And the idea there is the same thing. In OSS, I, just, I need my control. You bring it down, it's all there. I'm not accepting something from someone else. I'm testing that thing that I built here. Um, and the part I care about a lot, so this is just a, I encourage you to check it out if you're into the PyTest side, is tests are reusable. Um, how many of you have written tests where the tests themselves take inputs? Right, it's a, it's a strange concept frequently. Oh, I like that, good. So in Go, if you're used to, the testing frameworks in Go, most of us, what we do is we set up a struct, and then we populate that struct, and then we just run through the same test repeatedly, which is great. PyTest makes it um, both more painful but more readable because my test function can accept inputs and then I can decorate my test with the right inputs, which means I can have a test, for example, where I'm running the Redis Py tests against a Redis enterprise, and that's great. And my input can be all of the versions of the library I want to test. So I'll run the same set of tests on 4.4, 4, 4.4.1, 4, 4, 4, 1, 4, 4, I don't even know yet. Um, but we do that without thinking. The cost of even trying that out is very, very low. It's compute time, not human time. Obviously, there's a ton of things that were screwed up here along the way. I want some of you to point them out, too, to be honest with you. So location matters, right? Um, I think most of us now start to be cloud native by default. Like, I'm just going to go push it up there, and I'm going to pop it, and I'll see what happens, and we'll live with it. That's really expensive when you have multiple platforms in a CI system, and you haven't really figured it out yet. Um, I mentioned ACT, A-C-T, earlier, that GitHub tool that allows me to test my workflows locally. Yes, it runs things elsewhere, but I don't have to wait for the entire cycle. That's really important, right? So for me, the investment was everything possible to test things locally. That means pulling it into scripts because I can debug it locally, right? I have some of that 
code that we have to get back to and clean up because it's in GitHub Actions. But the reality is Actions is an amazing runner and I want to do all of my debugging locally, whether it's with Bash DB to test out my Bash or something else along the way. And my test code lives outside of my CI platform. Um, the reasons these things end up mattering is, as of now, you can get M1 instances in Amazon. Um, Circle CI, as a CI platform, also supports M1s. That was great. GitHub Actions does not, for the record. A year ago, none of those things were possible. So there's a cloud called Scaleway, if you know. I actually think they're based in France. And my solution to that is boring. There's a machine, and it's turned on, and we SSH into it, and it's not clean. It can't be clean, but it can be as clean as possible, and we can at least test it that way to start. Now that these other options exist, we can transition to having a nice, clean, just like I would expect in Linux, right? Give me a machine that has nothing on it, and we'll move our way through that. But those things matter, because testing on Scaleway via SSH is running the exact same unit tests over that network with ideally no changes, so the actual difficult part of the configuration is making sure I got SSH and key exchange right, as opposed to actually doing any of this. And huge takeaway is version pinning helps, but it doesn't guarantee. How many of you have pinned yourself to a library and said, awesome, everything works? But it doesn't, because things change around you. My favorite example in all of this was when I learned about Docker manifests. Um, Docker tools, by default, for a long time, have pushed, and life was great. Then there was a change to the manifest API upstream in Docker Hub. So even the Docker push no longer functioned the way I would expect, like just push me my Docker upstream go because of a manifest problem. And that's when we learned to, I'm just going to go build them repeatedly. I'm going to go push those. And then I'm going to build a manifest. And then I'm going to push those. And the result of that Docker change, even though we use this for Redis stack now, also became how we build MemTier Benchmark, a benchmarking tool. And basically everything, right? Now, instead of building Dockers in general by, I'm going to go leave a Docker file in, let Docker Hub do its thing, which it does, and it's great. It's more I want control over that. So some projects may use QMU to build multiple Dockers from the same file. Some may build each Docker in their own place, unify them, and then push them upstream. But the reason for that is that, look, it's great that I know I'm using exactly this version of a tool, but the rest of the internet keeps changing. Otherwise, software would be like building. Um, I know people are biased, and some people love huge PRs. Some people have tiny PRs. Um, I really like tiny PRs. <laughs> I like tiny PRs because fewer things change. I also make really large PRs because sometimes you don't have that choice. So you have to be pragmatic. But a mistake that I made is I'm building this thing and it's great, and I love it, and oh, it's definitely going to work everywhere. We'll just send it upstream. And then I spent time chasing my own tail, right? This doesn't work on ARM. This doesn't work on this Ubuntu. This Red Hat. I should just do it once, learn from the experience, and then clean it up afterwards. Do it the right way. So a pattern of one, a lot of us try to learn from, right? I did it the one time. It looks like this pattern makes sense. I'm just going to go. But actually do it twice. Like Genuinely see the implementation of that decision so that you can then see how and what happens accordingly. Because um, that leads you to the refactoring side, right? I made this mistake. I keep making this mistake. A lot of us will always make this mistake throughout our careers, except for when we finally stop. And that's like, I'm going to get it right, and then I'm going to extend it. I'm going to learn from that pattern. I'm going to get the refactoring once. So I now have it working on both of them. Now I can extend you to the other 20. I don't have to start from that location. And Something we all do, we use the path of least resistance, right? I want to choose that thing because it works. And that's great, but I have absolutely no control over the path of least resistance. When I use an external service, which is amazing because it gets me started faster, I end up in this problem where, okay, I now need to tweak this particular setting for something, and I just can't with some services, and I can with others. That doesn't mean you don't use the external services. It just means everything has a trade-off, and you have to think about those trade-offs. It's fine to accept them. It's great even. Um, generate, don't copy was, you know, we've talked about it earlier, but I didn't start the project that way, right? I didn't generate configuration files at the beginning, and we're not done cleaning it up. But the reality is, I generate a Docker file now. I don't copy the same, I don't edit the same Docker file 16 times, or use that bash piece in the middle. And again, this extends more than this project. Even though MemTier benchmark, this other project, our benchmarking project, 
what we do there is we reuse QMU and just build the same Docker file on multiple platforms. What actually happens is we generate the Docker file and then we build it on multiple platforms. Our individual, each of these capabilities, they have their own build system and they do their own thing because the developers need to do whatever they need to do, right? Just like me and my developers, we need to do whatever we do. But again, it's not going to be a single Docker file. There's one in the repo so that someone can see it and use it. But the thing we use to build it, go generate. It's easier to read. Um, one of my favorite examples is there's something we're working on, I'm working on right now, called uh, the new name is Triggers and Functions. So like database triggers kind of in Redis. And instead of having a Docker file for every platform, so I need to test, I've got some Ubuntu's and some Red Hat's and some ARM things, I have some Jinja, and there's an RPM piece, uh, sorry, a Red Hat piece and a Debian piece, and that gets included the right way. I have some ifs around the packaging that are different. Um, and instead, there's a single script that just takes those, pushes them together, and then generates a Docker, and then type Docker build, live your life. Um, and that was really powerful for us because it became easier. I've heard that Podman just has this, and I just haven't gotten there yet. So if anyone has, I totally want to know. I'll be honest with you. And I'm going to breathe. Cool. All right, and then we're going to be done. So if you take nothing from it, these are some of the tools we talked about. They apply to you the way they apply to you. For me, my OS is a tool. Um, it was both painful because of me, but I run Arch Linux. It's not because I'm a diehard Arch Linux fan, though I am. Um, I've run a lot of Linuxes. The reality is I can't do this work not on Linux. If I have a Mac, I can't do this. I, I don't have access to some of these things. I can't test both the platforms. Rosetta gets in the way. Um, PKG to app image, at least on the Ubuntu's and the Red Hats I went to use, because I, I admit I didn't use Fedora and I haven't used Rawhide. They just weren't functional. So having Arch and being able to type like, yay, thing, now I have you, I can do all of my testing locally, that really speeds things up. And every time I want to test building a snap, for example, I have all of the tools. I don't have to fight my operating system so that I can try doing my work. I don't have to play like, okay, let's go spin up a node in Amazon just for now and maybe I'll leave it running forever or maybe I'll go delete it later and like I'm a tree-hugging eco-hippie. I'm definitely not going to leave it for later. I'll feel bad about that. So. My computer, it can do stuff. For me, that's the right answer. Um, take from it what you will. For me, Jinja was the huge piece, applying it here as opposed to just for web templating and having the ability to use FPM to wrap things. And if you have questions, I want to answer them. And if you don't have questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, my friend. Oh. Thank you. Yes, sir. And I'm uh, the Debian and Red Hat uh, packager. Oh, I'm so Sandra. sorry, this totally applies to you. Yeah, it totally like, applies, and we are so far behind. We should have it's beers about funny. this. Uh, we're not doing QMU, we're not doing uh, uh, FPM, we're not doing any of this stuff, so it's, it's magic. Um, well, one of the really big problems that we've got, you touched on it with version pinning, mm -hmm. um, and that the dependencies, the, the provided dependencies or the system dependencies can change, yep. and they do. They have a separate timeline of Always. change to your GitHub code repository. So CI is not about testing each char or change. It's simply about changing uh, a changing environment. Correct. Uh, Debian packages. If your Docker files do a up, uh, up, uh, update, every time that runs, it's a completely different output. Yeah. How do you deal with that either at the code level or at the CI? So I'll be honest with you. Um, first of all, it's a great question, by the way. Um, it's a great question because the way in like 2001 we dealt with it was you would pin the individual parts that you actually cared about at the OS level. Um, as I'm sure you've learned with your customers the or your users, the reality is I in no way can control how up to date anyone's operating system is, right? I'll be honest. I love Arch. I update my Arch monthly, maybe. So in CI, I test against the tip of that operating system. Um, and that's what I do. I'll be honest with you. I, don't, I have to pick a stance. So I can either test it completely unpatched, I can test it at random places, or I can test it at the tip. If I saw that the OS got in the way enough, I would probably test all three, to be honest, because I'm pedantic and the computers are going to do it. Um, but the reality is I'm one person, I happen to work on this, I work on entire other things too, so this is not 
this is like under half a day of my life um, monthly. The hopefully w further less than that. The reality is I think you just pick a stance and you go with it and there's no good answer. If you see the customer feedback and user feedback is people are using untest uh, like unupdated OSs, go take something older, like pin yourself to an older Docker for Ubuntu if you can, or even build things, throw them into your own Docker hub location and then you can go pill those Dockers. It's not ideal, but you're kind of trying to do the best you can with what you have. It's probably a garbage answer, I'm really sorry. Anything else? Awesome, thanks everybody. <laughs>